VCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Morris, for the kind introduction. I, uh, we've got an interesting program today. The other day I was looking at a, a newspaper clipping sent to me. And it showed a beautiful full-color picture of a law officer uh, sitting, standing behind her squad car. And there she had in her hands a controlling device. And there on the trunk was a little thing that you call a drone. It only weighed three, four, five pounds, whatever it is. But a cute-looking little helicopter that takes off. It's got several propellers, and it can do all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, you've seen these demonstrations in toy stores where they have these little handheld helicopters, and they've even come up with one now for less than $100 that'll take pictures, video pictures from up in the air. But uh, now we have the drones looking over our shoulder and the use of drones now on a domestic sense. We've heard about the big drones that they use and literally have lethal power, but now we find them in our country and uh, using them for domestic purposes, Uh, like people that speed or people that have, well, if they're doing clandestine things, they can look over walls or look down from, oh, several hundred feet above. But the big issue, not we're not talking about the drones today, but the issue is government looking over your shoulder. and, And believe me, I appreciate good government. I mean, we need it in America especially. We see those who are anarchists who would like to destroy America's way of life. And in some ways, they've pretty much succeeded to discourage us in how our country is going, in many cases, down the tubes, where you see our liberties being abridged more often than not. But what we're talking about here is, whether it's the drones or whether it's the filtering of uh, the Internet now or listening in on your cell phone calls as they do in England, the issue is the census. You know, that thing where every year they send out to over 3 million people, a thing that's put out by the Census Bureau, and uh, it is sent out so that you can answer these questions that are absolute. I mean, it's called the American Community Survey. And it boasts that the collected information is helpful to private industry, providing confirmation from the federal government itself that the survey is unconstitutional, according to a prominent public interest lawyer. The detailed questionnaire demands that consumers answer under penalty of law queries about the emotional health, mortgages, marital history, (laughs) bathing habits, utility bills, personal possessions, and everything. Now, World Net Daily has a video that they show. Uh, Bob Unruh uh, wrote the article called Caught Census Bureau on the Wrong Side of the Law. But it seems to me now, I mean, even Robert Groves, the director of the Census Bureau, explains in a new letter to John Whitehead, the president of Rutherford Institute, how the ACS provides important statistical information that promotes legitimate governmental interests. It also provides the information that can be useful to private industry and private entities, said Groves. But that boast, according to John Whitehead, who we're acquainted with, is just confirmation of the unconstitutionality of the federal government's demands for detailed information. And the survey goes beyond the original goal of the constitutionally authorized census. And Whitehead explained this, uh, it's with, uh, with which uh, it was to count the population so that the U.S. seats could be apportioned, meaning in the House, the House of Representatives. That's what it's all about. Well, as we look at that, and it obviously is is set up, here's the Constitution of the United States. And under uh, Section 2 of Article 1, it says representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states 
which may be included within its union, according to their representative numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, free persons, okay, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians, not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States in every subsequent term of ten years, in such manner as they shall by law direct. So the Constitution calls for a census. But that's just counting people. That's counting noses. That's counting how many people are out there. And I don't know if you have seen... <laughs> This is, well, I'm going to share it with you today because it's downright humorous. (laughs) It's called the American Community Survey. Now, I'm holding it in my hands. Uh, 28 pages, by the way. 28 pages. They claim it will only take 38 minutes to complete this mandatory survey. However, (laughs) they (laughs) they have a manual that shows you how to do this. A manual that has... Oh, let me see. I've got this thing here. Good grief. They have a 16-page manual that tells you... This is the guide. Yeah, 16-page manual tells you how to fill out the American Community Survey in case you don't understand. And so you got... 38 minutes? Uh, who's who's kidding me here? 38 minutes just to read the 16-page manual. But that's what we're talking about today, the community survey, the American Community Survey, under the Census Bureau, which wants to find out all the important things about you. Important it is, it says. Well, let me let me share some things with you. Because, oh, they also have a group question. If you're not a family and you're involved in a group housing, such as dorms or nursing homes or barracks or correctional facilities. Yeah, even prisoners signing up for the census. Well, let's go to the survey, because this is an education which uh, we're going to go on today. And I'm sorry if if I'm kind of getting emotional here, but I can't believe this. Now, the first page, it asks for very important things like your name and your first name and your middle initial. And uh, then how it talks about person one and person two and person three and person four and person five and person six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve, if you have that many people in your house. But it wants to know all those things about each one. And, of course, it asks, please answer both questions about, uh, about question five about Hispanic origin and question six about race. For this survey, Hispanic origins are not races. Is person four of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? And what is person four race? Then they want to know what the the gender is. And how is this one person related to the next person? Person one through eight. And on it goes. Is person three of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? They know Why didn't they ask about being Swedish? Or Norwegian, or, or something there. How is person one related to person two? Husband or wife, biological son or daughter, adopted son or daughter, stepson, stepdaughter, brother, sister, father, mother, grandchild, pre- parent in law, son in law, daughter in law, other relate, re- relative, rumor or border, housemate or roommate, unmarried partner, foster child or other non-related. And on it goes about person 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, even up to uh, number 12. Well, that's just for starting. Now, I know we're not going to get through this in the first segment, but I'm going to start, hopefully. Because question 1 talks about your housing. What best describes the building that's in which you live? A mobile home? A one-family house? detached from any other house, a one-family house attached to one or more houses, 
a building with two apartments, a building with three or four apartments, a building with five to nine apartments, a building with 10 to 19 apartments, a building with 20 to 49 apartments, a building with 50 or more apartments, or a boat, RV, or a van. So if you're a vagabond driving around with your RV out on the road, they want to know how many people you got in there. This is a survey, folks. Uh, When the house was first built, well, the house I'm living in was built back in the 50s, but I couldn't tell you the exact date. I can't even tell you the exact year. I guess it's out there somewhere. But it wants to know when the building was first built. I assume any additions would alter that. Question number three. When did person one move into this house, apartment, or mobile home? That is question three. Then question four, how many acres is this house or mobile home on? The question options, less than an acre. Then you skip to question six. But if it's more than an acre, one to 9.9 acres, or 10 or more acres. So if you're in the farm country... Maybe you live on a 40-acre plot, but it they want to know. Now, how this applies to how many representatives we have, you got me guessing. In the past 12 months is the next question. In the past 12 months, what were the actual sales of all the agriculture products from this property? Now, folks, if you live in an apartment in Chicago or Milwaukee or somewhere else. (laughs) What are the actual sales of all the agricultural products from your apartment? Well, we do have a Christmas cactus in our front room. And we do have some dandelions out in my my yard, which I'm going to have to deal with shortly because the grass is coming up. But I don't have any products that I sell. And so they want to know what is the actual sales of agricultural products that I produced at my house. Then it goes on. You've got to hear this. How many separate rooms are in this house, apartment, or mobile home? Rooms may be separated by built-in archways or walls that extend out at least six inches and go from floor to ceiling. Include bedrooms, kitchens, of course, exclude bathrooms, porches, and balconies, foyers, hallways, or unfinished basements and then you must put in the number of rooms in your house and then it says how many of these rooms are bedrooms they want to know what these rooms are used for count as bedrooms these rooms that you would list if you this house or apartment or mobile home were for sale or rent in other words you're promoting it if this is an efficiency studio apartment <laughs> print zero i remember living in a in a, an efficiency apartment where you pulled the couch out and it became the bed. I remember early in in our marriage, Frida and I lived in a little apartment where the bed folded out of the wall. We never had to fill out these crazy things, though, to tell the government what kind of an apartment we lived in. I think our rent was $40 a month, dare I say that, in this economy. Well, we're going to cover more of these interesting things that are out there for us to deal with in this American census that is required by law. We're going to find out what's going to be happening coming up here shortly. Stay with us. This is downright interesting as we share what this is demanding from you, the taxpayer. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist and geologist at the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, I saw on TV that that huge desert in India used to be a well-watered region. Could this be true? Chris, this possibly is true. We see the same sort of evidence in the Sahara Desert. By using infrared subsurface scanners, they can see ancient riverbeds which have totally dried out and now are covered by sand. The Bible indicates that the world before the flood was a wonderful well-watered planet, but that was destroyed by the flood of Noah's day. Following the flood came the Ice Age, during which all the northern regions, like up in Europe or Canada, were under ice. But the lower regions were much more temperate. Even the Sahara Desert would have been a flowering garden. This all changed as the Ice Age came to an end, and that was just a few thousand years ago. Chris, the evidence that we see in geology and geography and agriculture, it all fits with that back-to-Genesis picture. 
For more on creation, visit our website at icr.org. And welcome back to Crosstalk, where we're talking about this new, well, maybe not so new, American Community Survey that has raised its ugly head again. And uh, people have been, well, we'll cover some more of these interesting things that they're wanting to know about you, the taxpayer, when you get this mandatory survey. And uh, they say if you don't comply, they'll, they'll put you in jail or fine you or do something terrible. Well, I'm I'm reading the questions that they're asking about where you live. Now, this, again, remember, the Constitution simply says that we need to count noses. How many people, which will determine how many representatives we have. That's constitutional. But where did this, this, and they're asking for this confidential information, the confidential information that will never be, it won't breathe a word of it to a soul out there. <laughs> and yet, they are stating the fact that this will help industry with all this information. It will help the businesses. Well, if it's confidential and it goes nowhere, how in the world is this going to help business? Is this doublespeak? Well, you determine it. Well, here we go. Here's more things they're demanding. Does this house, that's your house, or apartment, or mobile home, They're not talking about tents or shacks, but these house, apartment, or mobile home. Does it have hot and cold running water? Does it have a flush toilet? Now, they don't ask if it has a little house with a moon on the door, but uh, some of us will remember back to those years many, many, many years ago. A bathtub or a shower. A sink with a faucet. In other words, if you have a sink... And you have to pour the water in the sink. They want to know that. Does it have a stove or a range? A cooking range, obviously, for baking bread. Or I remember the olden days when we had a wood stove in our kitchen. You say, you can't be that. Oh, yeah, I am. Even it had a, a reservoir on the side where you put water and it got hot. You could get hot water out of that thing whenever you needed it. Well, I remember the days of the icebox, too. And then the refrigerator, of course... But does your home have a refrigerator, and does it have telephone service from which you can both make and receive calls, including cell phones? How many automobiles, vans, and trucks of one-ton capacity or less are kept at home for use by members of this household? I mean, do you have a dump truck or a semi or a diesel or a a little mini truck or a mini Cooper or a Model T Ford. <laughs> they want to know how many vehicles, and they have a, a place for up to six or more under one home. Well, there may be some homes that do have that many vehicles. However, which fuel is used most for heating this house or apartment or mobile home? Now, how do you keep it warm? Gas from underground pipes serving the neighborhood? Gas bottled like LP gas? Electricity, fuel oil, kerosene, etc.? Coal or coke, wood, solar energy, other fuel, or no fuel used? You don't have any heating. Oh, that would be kind of chilly. But they want to know that. Uncle Sam wants to know all of this confidential information that will go nowhere. Tongue-in-cheek. Last month, what was this? They want to know. Last month, in the last 30 days, what was the cost of electricity for this house, apartment, or mobile home? And there's a place they want you to put in the the dollars. Last month, what was the cost for gas for this house, apartment, or mobile home? And it says, include in the rent, was the heat included in the rent? Or was the electric payment also included in the rent? Or no charge? Was the gas and heat included? In the past 12 months, what was the cost of water and sewer for this house, apartment, or mobile home? Then it goes on. It says, in the past 12 months, what was the cost for oil, coal, kerosene, wood, etc., for this house, apartment, or mobile home? Oh, it goes on. They need more information. 
In the past 12 months, did anyone in this house receive food stamps or a food stamp benefit card? They want to know that. And is this house, apartment, or mobile home a co- part of a condominium? And what is the monthly condominium fee that you pay? In this, is this house or apartment or mobile home uh, owned by you or someone in this household with a mortgage or a loan, include home equity loans, owned by you or someone in this household free and clear? In other words, you paid it off. Or are you renting? Or is it occupied without any payment of rent? You live in there free. That's question 14. Question 15, what is the monthly rent for this house, apartment, or mobile home? And does the monthly rent include the meals? That's a new one. About how much do you think this house and lot and apartment or mobile home and lot, if owned, would sell for if you were for, if it were for sale? Okay, now you become a real estate agent. What are the annual re, real estate taxes on this property? And what is the annual payment for fire hazard and flood insurance? on this property. Now, pray tell, what does the fire insurance or flood insurance have to do with how many representatives are appointed to Congress? 19. Do you or any member of this household have a mortgage, deed, or a trust, contract to purchase, or similar debt on this property? And how much is the regular monthly mortgage payment on this property? Does the regular monthly mortgage payment include payments for real estate taxes on this property? Does the regular monthly mortgage payment include payments for fire hazard and flood insurance on this property? Do you or any other member of this household have a second mortgage on this property? Oh, it doesn't stop there. Now, that was just about your house. Now it starts in on person number one. Where was this person born? If in the United States, you print the name of the state where you were born. If it's outside the United States, then you put the name of the country. Is this person a citizen of the United States? Click yes, born in the U.S., then you can skip to question 10. But if not, then you've got to fill out the other questions. When did this person come to live in the United States? At any time in the last three months, has this person attended school or college? What grade or level was this person attending? Uh, What is the highest degree or level of school that this person has completed? Number 12, the question focused on this person's bachelor degree. Please print below the specific majors of any bachelor's degrees this person has received. Question 13, this is of person 1. What is the person's ancestry or ethnic origin? They want to know about my dad coming from Sweden. Hmm. Question 14, does this person speak a language other than English at home? Yeah, jag talar svensk lite grann och norsk, bägge två. What language? Well, that was Swedish and Norwegian. But how well, do I have to tell them that? How well does this person speak English? Very well, well, not well, or not at all. Does this person live in this house or apartment one year ago? Where did this person live one year ago? And they want the address of where they lived and the name of the town or post office. And this is still asking questions about person number one. Is this person currently covered by any of the following types of health insurance or health coverage? And they go through the the litany. Is this person deaf, or does he or she have serious difficulty in hearing? Is this person blind? Because of physical or mental or emotional condition, does this person have serious difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions? Does this person have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs? Does this person have difficulty dressing or bathing? Because of a physical, or mental, or emotional condition, does this person have difficulty doing errands alone, such as visiting a doctor's office or shopping? What is this person's marital status? In the past 12 months, did this person get married, widowed, divorced? How many times has this person been married? Once, two times, three or more times? 
In what year did this person last get married? And the year. Has this person given birth to any children in the past 12 months? Does this person have any of his or her own grandchildren under the age of 18 living in this house or apartment? Is this grandparent currently responsible for most of the basic needs of any grandchildren under the age of 18 who lives in this house or apartment? And how long has this grandparent been responsible for these grandchildren? Oh, question 26, has this person ever served on active duty in the U.S. military? 27, when did this person serve on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces? And they give all kinds of questions about what war they were in. Does this person have a VA service-connected disability rating? What is this person's service-connected disability rating and the rating of percentages? Oh, we haven't even finished question on person one. Last week, did this person work for any or for pay at a job or a business? Yes or no. Last week, did this person do any work for pay even for as little as one hour? One hour. At what location did this person work last week? They want the address. Name, city, town, post office. And is the work location inside the limits of that town or city? How did the person usually get to work last week? Car, truck, bus, trolley, streetcar, subway, railroad, ferry boat, taxi cab, motorcycle, bicycle, walked, or worked at home? Or other method, like pogo stick or something like that. I'm being sarcastic. Yes, I am. But if you don't laugh, you cry. Oh, we haven't finished yet with person one. And our break will be coming up here in just a few moments. But question 32, how many people, including this person, usually rode to work in a car, truck, or van last week? What time did this person usually leave home to go to work last week? How many minutes did it usually take this person to get from home to work last week? Last week, was this person temporarily absent from a job or a business? Has this person been informed that he or she will be recalled to work within the next six months? Does uh, During the last four weeks, has this person been actively looking for work? Last week, could this person have started a job if offered one or returned to work if recalled? When did this person last work? even for a few days? How many weeks did this person work, even for a few hours, including paid vacation, paid sick leave, and military service? Oh, during the past 12 months and the weeks worked, how many hours did this person usually work each week? All of this in 38 minutes. Good grief, it's taken me longer to read that already. But we're not done. Person one has got more. And we'll probably bump over to the next segment to share this with you. Because this is what the government wants from you. And they want to ask these questions every year. And if you don't answer them, you can get penalized. You can get fined. You could probably be prosecuted. Oh, they say they haven't done it yet. But it's mandatory. Don't ever forget that. From the frontiers of scientific discovery, researchers are now taking design elements from the natural world and creating extraordinary breakthroughs that benefit our health, our quality of life, our ability to communicate, and even help us work more efficiently. Many of these are documented in the book, Discovery of Design. In this book, you'll learn how things like batteries, human organ repair, micro lenses, and even credit card security all have links to natural designs. You'll learn how innovations like solar panels in space use technology from beech tree leaves, how the study of the leg bone led to the building of the Eiffel Tower, how the study of the timber beetle helped to improve the use of chainsaws. Over 75 such illustrations are given. It's a fantastic journey into the intersection of science and God's blueprints for life. 
Discovery of Design is available for a donation of $16 or more to VCY America by calling 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829. And welcome back to Crosstalk, and uh, <clears throat> this is one for the books, let me tell you. But as we share this information with you, uh, this is no joke. I mean, th this is a survey, folks, a survey that everybody wants to know. It's called the American Community Survey, and they sent it out to millions of people wanting the answers. And what I've been reading you so far in this 38-minute survey that's supposedly to take this confidential survey... That should, all the information is secret, quiet, nobody gets it, but yet it's done so that business can benefit by it. Uh, I mean, this is double speak if I ever heard it. Well, I'm on the last page of the requirements just for person one. Now, so far, I've listed 41 different items, or 40. Number 41 is here, because they wanted to know when you last worked, even if you worked an hour. But 41 is... Was this person, now get this, an employee for a, priv a private for-profit company or an employee of a private not-for-profit company, tax-exempt group, or a local government employee or a state government employee or a federal government employee, or if you're self-employed in your own, on your own, not incorporated, or self-employed in your own corporation? or working without pay in a family business or farm. For whom did this person work? And you've got to fill out the name of the company and their employer. What kind of a, of a business or industry was this? They wanted to even know what you were doing. And is this mainly manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, or other agricultural construction services, government, etc.? Well, question number 45, what kind of work was this person doing? For instance, registered nurse, personnel manager, supervisor of order department, secretary, accountant, whatever. You've got to fill this in. Number 46, what were the person's most important activities or duties on the job? In other words, you pick out the things that you do every day and you have to determine what was the most important things that you did in that eight hours at work, aside from lunch. <laughs> Number 47, income in the past 12 months. Now, I thought we took care of that with the Internal Revenue Service. But they want to know wage, salary, commissions, bonuses, or tips from all jobs, and you put it in there, the total amount for the past 12 months. Then self Employment income from your own non-farm business or farm businesses, including proprietorship or partnership, a place to put that money in, and then interest dividends, non-rental income, royalty income, or income from estates and trusts. If Uncle Louis left you $10 in his will, it goes in there. Social Security. Oh, if you get Social Security checks like some of us old-timers you got to put that in there, or railroad retirement. Supplemental security income, SSI. Any public assistance or welfare payments, they want to know that. Uh, retirement, survivor, or disability pensions. Any other sources of income received regularly, such as VA payments, unemployment comp, child support, or alimony. And what was this person's total income during the past 12 months? Now, bear in mind, folks, I've just gone through 11 pages of this, but we've only touched on person one in your house. And it could go up to a dozen people asking these questions. Now, they do say that it's mandatory. By the way, I want to thank uh, Anna there in Hot Springs, Arkansas, for shooting a, a quick email into us here. It says, I received one of these surveys, and they called me every day, I finally called my congressman, and the call stopped that day, but not until I called Washington. Where did this lunacy come from? And who is in control of this thing anyway? Dare I say it one more time? That the inmates have taken over the asylum? Folks, 
there have been lots of people that have complained. And they've asked the question, do I have to answer these questions? And the response comes back, yes, you are legally obligated to answer all questions as accurately as you can. The relevant laws that may mandate this are Title 18, USC Section 3571, and Section 3559, which amends the Title 13 USC Section 221. Your answer is important. As a part of a sample, you represent many other people. Find out how each question helps your community, your state, and the federal government in questions in the form and why we ask. And the question, how do I benefit? Well, the information that the Census Bureau collects helps to determine how more than $400 billion of federal funding each year are spent in infrastructure and services. Your answers help state and local leaders make decisions about programs and investments such as new highways, schools, hospitals, job training, community centers, and emergency services. Well, may I counter that, and I've been in this town for 52 years, in the state of Wisconsin as well. 53 years, I think it is. Forgot to do the math. But I'll tell you this, I have seen cases where where allotted funds, like the highway department, those funds were siphoned into something else, and the white lines and the markers on the highways, it was so dangerous during rainstorms, you couldn't hardly tell what lane it was. And there's still some of those roads around, thankfully, that the infrastructure has started to... But where did that money come from? Where did it go? And who allotted it? And were they in their right mind in Washington when they did this? Uh, and were these people interested in this, or were they simply saying to one another in Congress, hey, you owe me one, and they voted for a different law? I'm, I'm questioning that. But you know, there have been enough people upset. And would you believe I'm holding in my hands here the story about H.R. 931, that's a House resolution, 931, House of Representatives. And here it is. It's interesting, which makes participation in the American Community Survey voluntary. Now, this H.R. 931 was introduced in the House over a year ago. The date on it is March 3, 2011. And folks, it is sitting in committee. This legislation presently has 61 co-sponsors. And would you believe it's sitting there in committee doing nothing? And you can contact the House Oversight Committee and Government Reform Committee. And I'm going to give you some phone numbers where I hope thousands of you will pick these numbers up and say, hey, I'm tired of this. Why in the world are you make it man make it, make it voluntary? But mandatory? They want to know if you have an outhouse. They want to know if your sink has a faucet. They want to know what time you leave for work, what kind of a car you drive. All of this to determine who is in Congress? This is ridiculous, in my opinion. Well, here, you can contact the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee and say, hey, how long are you going to be sitting on H.R. 931? This is a, a good bill, and it could be presented to Congress that will make it voluntary. You can contact them, and here's the phone number for the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. The phone number is in Washington, area code 202, and their number is 225-5074. Also, you can contact the House Judiciary Committee, because this thing's been referred to them, and they have reassigned it to two subcommittees. (laughs) Now, often I, I talk about committees, and I'm all for good committees when they get things done. But somebody once said that a camel is a horse built by a committee. At any rate, the House Judiciary Committee, which has also got their hands in this cookie jar, contact 202-225-3951. That's the House Judiciary Committee. When you're going to call and say, when are you going to get H.R. 931 passed so that we are not sitting here uh, under the threat of prosecution if you don't want to tell them how many outhouses you've got. That phone number again for House Judiciary is 202-225-3951. 
and in that it's gone to the subcommittee. Now, the House Judiciary Committee, they've relegated this to two their subcommittees, and those subcommittees on the Constitution, first of all, is 202-225-2825. That's a subcommittee on Constitution. That's 202-225-2825. And then it has also been referred to the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. Their phone number is 202-225-5727. 202-225-5727. Now, folks, in addition to that, you can contact your own congressmen and senators on this thing. In my opinion, it's lunacy. Now, you may think it's a good thing, and that's your thing. But contact your own congressmen and senators regarding H.R. 931. And here's the numbers where you can call the Capitol switchboard and talk to anybody you want to there. The phone number is 202-224-3121, 224-3121, or 225-3121. It's your opportunity. Enough of my chatter. I, I just, sometimes I have to read this and either laugh or weep, one of the two. But I'm going to open our phone lines right now. If you'd like to call us, 800-733-9829. Lines are open for your comments, your thoughts, as you join us on Crosstalk. And uh, I want to say thank you to all the stations that allow us to be on the air each day to talk about these issues and others. They Many of them are spiritual issues that our nation must face, some other practical issues that we have to deal with. But our prayer is that God would somehow give us alertness of mind and courage of spine to stand up and let our voice be heard. Wouldn't it be wonderful if these committees, with these phone numbers I've given you, if they received 5,000 phone calls today? Because I know that there are more than five. Well, we're 92 radio stations. And if each one had 100 people listening, that would be 9,200 people. That's 9,200 phone calls if all of you will be faithful to pick up the phone and, and take some action. But the thing is called HR. That's H.R. 931, House Resolution, to make this thing voluntary. And if you want to tell them all about everything, that's fine. That's your privilege. But if it's confidential, how in the world is benefit to all these businesses that are getting this? Talk about doublespeak. That's my opinion. But I think they need to hear the voice of people across America. And hopefully today you'll take that opportunity. Now, you can hang it up and say, well, Vic, you're off on a tangent. Fine. Okay. Just forget it. But I believe firmly that there are thousands of people, when their voice is heard in Washington, the congressman will, you know, not worrying about going into a hot tub after work to relax their aching muscles from carrying the weight of the world or going to the exercise room or whatever or all the perks and benefits that they may have. You know, some of you Wisconsinites can call Jim Sensenbrenner. He's having hearing things around the state every once in a while. But you've got the numbers, folks, in Washington, and we've given them to you. Now the rest is up to you. We'd like to hear your comments, and the lines, by the way, are jammed here. We'll be right back in just a minute. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. Continuing our commentaries on 20 characteristics of false teachers embraced by the false church. Number four is false teachers willingly embrace unbiblical philosophies. 2 Timothy 4.4 4 says, And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That word fables is translated also philosophies. Isn't that interesting? Because Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. 
So false teachers turn their ear away from truth and follow unbiblical philosophies. The very same unbiblical philosophies were warned about in Colossians 2.8 not to be cheated by. So false teachers knowingly embrace false teaching and unbiblical philosophies. Our website, worldviewweekend.com. Okay, this is going to be kind of a speed round because we've got about nine minutes to go. Make your comments as concise and to the point. We're going right now to Todd, who is in Florida. And, Todd, you are on the air. Go ahead. Uh, uh, listen, I just wanted to mention this. About six and nine months ago, I was outside my house one day down here in Florida, and there were two kind of middle-aged women there, and one was at my front on, on my front porch, actually. And I said, can I help you? What are you doing? And, and she had a handheld device in her uh-huh. hand yes. just pointed at my front door. Uh-huh. And she said, don't worry, that's nothing. It was just something for the census. I'm getting your exact front door location on a GPS. And I said, well, what does that have to do with the census? Uh, I said, are you doing some kind of a survey? And she said, no, we just want to have the exact location of your front door. Now, why in the world would they want that? And there were two women there getting paid probably 12 or $14 an hour to collect that kind of data. But why would they want the location of my front door? Sir, they've been doing that for some time, and they are GPS recording devices. And with the GPS logs exactly where your address is, and there's more than, more than you that's concerned about this business. And if I understand it takes a GPS reading, I don't know if it takes a picture of it. But uh, they are doing this. And the question is, why do they need that unless the IRS agents need to know where to come and collect? I, I, I just, it's beyond me, beyond me. I just want to, you know, ask everybody to pray for the country. Pray, pray, pray. Thank you, sir. And do be one of those that calls today, okay? Call your congressman. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's uh, go to Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And we've got an open line right now, 800-733-9829. Lauren, in Oak Creek, you're on the air. Hi, This is Lauren, and I'm calling about your comment about the confidentiality, that you feel that it's doublespeak. Well, the people that have taken this uh, oath of confidentiality through the Census Bureau takes it extremely seriously, and they've taken the oath for life. They are not able to discuss it with family members. If uh, a person would meet somebody they know, they could not pass that information on. Are Are you one of those people that does the census work? Absolutely, sir. And I, I know you personally. Sure. And um, uh, so I, I'm taking some offense by the sarcastic uh, tone when uh, research hasn't been done enough into this American Community Survey and what it's all used for. Well, let me let me say this, Lauren, and I'm I'm not trying to offend you, but I will be I will hold my opinion, and it may be different from yours, because and, number because number one, the Constitution calls for counting noses. It doesn't count for counting outhouses or bathrooms or sinks or whether they have a faucet or not. It and does, I appreciate that's your, an invasion. Uh, that's you don't a, have to answer all the questions, but I, really? I do feel. Um, where does it, ma'am? Uh, kindly, where does it say that you don't have to? It says it's well, mandatory. Well, it would be important that you would answer all of them, but there are uh, if there's something that you were uncomfortable with, um, there would be something that we would be able to. Um, eliminate. Lauren, Lauren, in all fairness, you say eliminate. Who has the authority to eliminate that? I do. And, but, but the, and but, with regard to the business, you said that how will um, you know, the information going to businesses, it does not go to businesses only in statistical format. And if you would go to the website of census, www.census.gov, you will be able to go and get that data just like mm. any business, who, any business that wants to start up a, a noodle. Okay, or Lauren, whatever. Yeah, Lauren, let me ask you a question. What does the word confidential mean? It means that you are not able to uh, discuss it with anybody. Disclose any of the information that is collected. Okay, well, how does it get then to this database so that everybody finds it? It goes through, um, it's encrypted. And I'm sure with no, technical the f- knowledge, mm-hmm. it's encrypted and it goes over, uh, it goes right directly into headquarters. No, but what I'm saying, Lauren, it may be encrypted, but when it gets to headquarters, it's now in English. Correct, but they are 
they have taken a, uh, an oath of confidentiality as well. The but, but, that- but, but, Lauren, I'm running a business, and I want the data. And, and is it is if I want to have uh, walking water instead of running water in my house, that is no bearing. That's my confidential privilege. That's true. That's true. But uh, you you made a um, kind of a sarcastic comment about that. Yes, I did. Just a few years ago, I interviewed a, a household and right outside of Milwaukee, and they don't have running water still. So what? So what business is that of Congress? Well, they would be representing other people who still don't have running water. Ma'am, what you do, made it sound like everybody does. Well, not everybody does have running water. But, ma'am, what business is this of Jim Sensenbrenner, who's a friend of mine, or anybody else out there of whether I have running water or not? And the fact here is that this has no bearing on how many congressmen we have. And, and if it is confidential, if yes, you yes. say it's confidential, yet you personally have the right to tell a person that they don't have to answer that question, but it doesn't say that here in printing. It says every question is something that's mandatory. Well, it would be, uh, as you would know as an intelligent man, that with statistics, the, uh, the, the less statistics that are involved makes it less accurate. So you certainly want 100%. But if a person had a concern about... I didn't want to tell you whether I'd flush uh, flush toilets or not. Who I determines? Who that. determines? And and I want a straight answer, Lauren. Who determines what questions can be avoided by the person who is filling out the form? Who the, has the authority to say you don't interviewer. have to answer? No, the paper doesn't. The interviewer well, isn't here well, at all. It's a piece of paper that I've got. Yes. They get that paper form, but as that person said in. Um, in Hot Springs, somebody came to their door. If they don't if they don't fill that out in paper, they will get somebody at the door or and, a phone call or something. And if they don't feel like doing that, then you can tell them they don't have to do it, right? Something is better than nothing, Vic. Okay, and, okay but uh, Lauren, here what I'm saying is this. This is intimidation in my book. This is when somebody is imposing upon somebody, making them feel that they have to do this, but yet you maintain the uttermost authority, say, well, you can skip this. And there's nothing in writing that says that you have that authority. I see nothing there. It says it is absolutely mandate. And, uh, Lauren, you and I can... Many, many people Mm -hmm. uh, send those forms in Mm -hmm. with missing paperwork, with missing things. Okay, It may not say that, but some people do. Well, Lauren, that's the end of our time today, but I'm so glad you called because it it fills in the blanks that apparently this is something that every interviewer has the option of becoming the chief inspector and to give lenience. And so the question, is it truly mandatory or is it at the option of the interviewer? To me, I see this as flawed. That's my opinion. Thanks, Lauren, for calling. been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from crosstalkamerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.